This week on the WriterCon podcast. I think to write every day. I mean, that's the one that I think it seems to me when I talk to writers who have sort of made it to the point where they've completed a novel or they're successfully in classes or they're published, sort of like whatever whatever their standard is for being a successful writer. And they've made those goals. It's because they've, they're always, they touch the computer every day. And someone recently said to me, if you touch your project every day, it'll mm. just build up a muscle and becomes a habit. I usually try for about 500 words a day. I tell myself, okay, just get 500 words out. And then sometimes when that starts to feel good, you can push towards a thousand or 1500. But even just to tell yourself that every day I'm going to write 500 words. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker books on writing, and Renee Gutteridge, best-selling author of over 30 novels and screenplays. Thank you, Jesse Ulrich, and hello, writers. We're back after a brief hiatus, mostly created by my travel pa- plans, but I'm back in Oklahoma now, and of course, like all good, dedicated WriterCon writers, I wrote my chapter this morning. Renee, how's your script coming along? Still coming. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten notes and I'm applying and still writing. Good Should be you. done in by December. In oh, December. Fantastic. Jesse, have you, you worked on any good audio books lately? Hmm. Well, I haven't worked um, on two books recently from a William Bernhardt that <laughs> people might be familiar with. He's pretty good, isn't it? I've yeah. Heard. <laughs> this is surprisingly good poet. So, yeah, um, yeah your your uh, your book of poetry and um, your Yuletide Splitsville short story I worked on recently, and um, the Splitsville's done, and the poetry book will be done soon. Fantastic! Thanks for that completely unforced plug. <laughs> Today, our guest is Katie Size. She's the New York Times best-selling author of Open House and We Were Mothers, and she's got a new book out called The Break. We want to talk to her about this new book and her writing process and a lot of other crazy stuff. But first, the news. First news story. There's a new report out that indicates, get ready for this, that self-publishing income now equals Another Penguin Random House. This came out of the Frankfurt Book Fair and actually came from a report given by two people at Rabbit and Kobo. And uh, let me just read this quote for you. In each of the markets that we are in as Kobo, self-publishing is the first, second, or third largest publisher in that market for us. Just to put this in a context that people can get their heads around, one in four books that we sell in English is a self-published title, which means that effectively for us, self-publishing is like having a whole other Penguin Random House sitting out in the market that no one sees, end quote. It's, it's like the dark matter of publishing, which <laughs> I thought was, I mean, I think there's a perception out there that uh, self-publishing is sort of, you know, an isolated uh, uh, thing done by a handful of losers and none of them make any money. And and to be fair, not everybody's self-publishing is making any money or finding readers, but clearly some people are in a significant way. What do you guys think? Is this going to, is this, so, you know, they're, they're finding readers. Are, are they going to find any validity or acceptance along the way? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Especially if if uh, if book publishers keep attempting to merge, making it harder to get published, like people will use the avenues available to them. Mm-hmm. And if and if self publishing is as equal to one of the biggest publishing houses, why wouldn't people at least try? Yeah. Well, I, I'm probably biased because I've been around long enough to remember when you know self publishing was very disdained, and for a reason. I mean, you couldn't you yeah. know, have a bunch of books published offset printing and then you'd have 5,000 books in your garage and no way really to sell them. But of course, digital books have uh, changed everything. Mm -hmm. My standpoint, you know, if traditional publishing, great if you can get it, but I'm always happy when authors have 
more avenues towards success. And mm -hmm. this has become a very valid one. I know a lot of people who are making a lot of money this way. All right, second news story. And this was suggested by Renee, uh, has to do with Colleen Hoover, uh, who is currently the best-selling novelist in the United States by such a huge margin that it's, it's hard to even compare. She, she has, in this past year, sold more books than James Patterson and Stephen King combined. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible. No, no metaphor I can come up with uh, gives you a real sense of the size and loyalty of the audience that she has developed, which, of course, is in large part derived from huge success on TikTok or BookTok. She now holds six of the top 10 spots on the New York Times paperback fiction, fiction bestseller looks list. And some of these are not books. Some of, uh, are not new books, I mean. Some of them go back years. This is a, a stunning number of simultaneous bestsellers from a single author who has sold over 8.6 million print books this year alone, more copies than the Bible, according to NPD book scan. <laughs> Renee, <Wow. laughs> yeah, no, uh, why do people always compare anything with the Bible? Why yeah, is that the touchstone? That's the technical, <laughs> I guess. How, how I many guess people cause... need extra copies of the Bible? Like, is it actually that big of a bestseller? <laughs> right. We pass it down in families, right? Like... <laughs> yeah. I guess it's a consistent seller. Anyway, yeah. R Renee, you suggested this story. Why? What do you think is the significance here? Well, probably the significance for me is not the significance for the business minded. Um, I will say that as you know, I've I've have 25 books or so, and I can tell you that my readers are getting younger due to um, Instagram and TikTok. So mm -hmm. it's been fun to see young readers. I'm getting you know direct messages, not emails, uh, from 20-somethings who have found my book through those kinds of means. But the thing that drew me to this story actually was reading, um, I read this, you know, through my New York Times subscription, and I was just, I remember I was just in bed reading about her journey of how, like, she writes mm -hmm. what she wants to write. She has passions yeah. and she has stories and she sits down and writes them. And a lot of times, you know, you'll hear things like, well, you have to stick to a genre. You'll hear that from probably your agent, maybe your publisher. Um, I think Colleen has blown the doors off that. You know, readers are loving books with passion that they can author loves to, to write. And, and we, you know, talk to authors who write what they want to write. Um, I think if you've got a good story, it's going to sell. Readers are going to find it. So uh, mm -hmm. it was encouraging to me to, you know, some of these really, really best-selling authors stick to a genre forever. You know, it's, it's they're in one genre and they're on that train forever. Um, right. Nothing wrong with that, Bill. I mean, you've made a great career doing that. And I think there's wisdom in that um, because you find your readers. Uh, but for authors like Colleen and me, uh, who do everything from suspense to silly comedy, this is an encouraging story. Yeah. Well, of course, that's what traditional publishing will want. If you have a hit in one field, they're going to want more of that. And, uh, you know, they're not going to want you to branch out. They want mm -hmm. more of what works until mm -hmm. finally your audience is sick of it and then they'll dump you and get somebody else. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, 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 I read the same story you did in the New York Times, but you know what I took away from it was it talked about when she was writing her first novel, which by the way, she self-published. She was living in a trailer house with her husband and young son, barely able to pay the bills. And now a few years later, she's got 8.6 million print books print books that's not even counting that's the e-books mind blowing that's 8.6 million print books writers persistence mm -hmm. pays off persistence write what you love stick with it she's the she's the jewel of authors hmm <laughs> Well, that's a pretty good comparison, Jesse. Yeah, right. I don't know if everybody will remember Jewel. Oh, that's you mean you mean a singer? I was. Yeah. Try, I thought you were thinking like a diamond. Or yeah, no. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it works. It works both ways. But yeah, you know, I mean the mm -hmm. the doing what you love, even if you're living in a you know a trailer or in your car, and right. sticking yeah. with it, like you know, I mean, yeah. 
99% of the time, it probably doesn't work, but the, the times it does, you know, mm-hmm. those are, those are incredible stories. And that's a lot of eBooks she's selling on top of her. Oh my gosh. It's, it's mind blowing. And it tells you the power of social media, you know, right. how many people are on social media and when something takes off on social media, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. So. All right, let's move on to our interview. Katie Seiss is the best-selling author of six novels, which have been included on Best Of and bestseller lists all over the place. She's been on the Good Morning America list, New York Post, Parade Magazine, and her current novel, the one hovering over my shoulder, is The Break. That's a Zibby's Book Club pick for November. She's a former TV host and jewelry designer, lives outside New York City with her husband, four children, and a golden retriever. And we want to talk about all that. Katie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you guys. All right. Traditional first question. If you could offer writers one piece of advice, I know you've got lots, but just one, (laughs) what would it be? I think to write every day. I mean, that's the one that I think it seems to me when I talk to writers who have sort of made it to the point where they've completed a novel or they're successfully in classes or they're published, sort of like whatever whatever their standard is for being a successful writer and they've made those goals, it's because they've, they're they always, they touch the computer every day. And someone recently said to me, if you touch your project every day, it'll mm-hmm. just build up a muscle and becomes a habit. I usually try for about 500 words a day. I tell myself, okay, just get 500 words out. And then sometimes when that starts to feel good, you can push towards a thousand or 1500. But even just to tell yourself that every day I'm going to write 500 words, because as, as you all know, it, you can write a book that way, you know, books are generally between, let's say, let's say most books are between 65 and 80,000 words, most of the novels that you'll read. And Mm -hmm. there's certainly longer ones as well, of course, but you can imagine that writing 500 to a thousand words a day, you can get a novel done pretty quickly that way. I'm totally in agreement. Even on Occasionally, there's a day when I can see I'm not going to be able to write a chapter or even like you were saying, 500 words. If I just open it up and look at it and remind myself what's going on, Mm -hmm. type a few words maybe, I think it makes a big difference. I think so too. Well, congratulations on your new book, The Break. This book has, to put it mildly, an unusual premise. Where did the idea for this come from? So this is the first time this had ever happened to me, but it actually came to me in a dream. And I've heard other writers say that. And I thought, what, you know, what must that be like? But I, one morning, a couple of years ago, I was just sort of like that, that cusp of waking up when you kind of remember all your dreams. And I I dreamt of a woman. I saw her with white blonde hair and I, her back was turned to me. I didn't see her face, but I saw her clawing. um, She was in a very elegant room with wallpaper. There was a piano and she was clawing at the walls and screaming for someone to give her back her baby. And so when I woke up, I felt really shaken. And it was like just one of those dreams that's, you know, really unsettling. And she stuck with me. So I kind of thought, I just kept thinking about her. Like it was, it was like as though she was already a character in my mind. She was kind of rattling around in my thoughts for a long time. And I even made a little document on my computer that said, um, that dream, that dream I had, or like that book I dreamt of, like I was already thinking like, oh, she could be, I felt like I understood her enough to write her. And I felt like what she wanted and needed even though I didn't know her story, I felt like I understood that she wanted her her baby back. And so I felt like that was something I could write towards and write to understand. Uh, mm-hmm. And there was times when I thought that the book would be too dark for me to write. Um, you know, I'm sort of like a scaredy cat who writes thrillers. So, <laughs> so I circled around it. I thought, okay, I don't know if I can do this, but I just kept, I kept thinking of her and I mm-hmm. thought, all right, well, I better try to start to write her. And so I did. And it felt like I, I, she felt like a mystery writer to me, which I've also never done before. I've never, I don't know that I've, I don't think I've ever had a character who was a writer. Um, but it was really enjoyable to write her as a writer because so much of who she is, this like overactive imagination, she's trying to figure out what's real, what's not real, who can she trust? Why does she have this feeling of dread? And, and she kind of has to almost, she almost starts to use some of her mystery writing skills and her, and her personality um, mm-hmm. to figure out the situation that she's in and the situation her family's in. Sure. Why don't you just give us the quick 30 second plot summary, just pe- so people know what we're talking about here. Okay. So the break is about a young woman named Rowan. She's 34 and she goes to deliver her baby in a New York city hospital. And she has a traumatic birth and she can't remember much of the birth, just little bits and pieces. 
but she returns home with her beautiful newborn Lila and she feels like something is, is terribly wrong. Uh, and her husband hires a beautiful young babysitter named June to help her sort of in this time of, of need. And one day Rowan looks down and she's absolutely sure that June has harmed the baby. And she starts to scream at June and, and asks for her baby back and accuses her of harming the baby when June has not. So June, of course, leaves you know, very distraught, which, and the neighbors hear all of this. And a few days later, June disappears hmm. and Rowan becomes a suspect, among other things. And she has to put her mind back together and face some really dark truths to get to the bottom of what happened to June, her babysitter. Oh my gosh, uh, that sounds amazing. I, I loved it. I love that you admitted you're a, a scaredy cat that writes thrillers. That's so mm -hmm. fun. I, I wonder how many there are out there uh, who feel that way too. But mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So as you're researching this, what did you come across some surprises in your research? Like what was some of the unexpected things that you came across? Well, w one of the most unexpected things is I, I was talking to an OBGYN and I was concerned that something that I was writing was just so far out there. And so without giving any spoilers away, there's something that happens in the book that I thought, I'm just not sure that this would happen or that a mom, this would happen to a mom, this would be her experience. And the OB told me that this wouldn't, this would be mild compared to what they see women experience postpartum, wow. um, mm -hmm. the terms of things, psychologically, the things that can happen and go awry. And so that made me realize, okay, there, there's, this is something that I want to talk about. And this is something that I, I really want to go there. Um, and so my research was mostly, I had several physicians read the book, probably like four or five. Um, and then a postpartum doula, um, just to sort of make sure that I was dealing with the harder topics in the book. And, you know, I just wanted to do them justice and, and deal with them sensitively. Um, and I'm a mom of four. So I have so many like, really wonderful friends of mine who've given birth and are really open. And all of us, you know, we talk all the time about our birth experiences and our postpartum experiences. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm grateful for those conversations because I feel like they, I mean, just mm -hmm. mostly I'm grateful for them because it's nice to have friends who are open about these things. And I think the conversation is becoming a lot more open. So I kind of wanted to hopefully contribute to that in a, in a meaningful way and do it, do it well. I mean, hope, you know, you always want to do these things well. And, but this was important to me to kind of get this right. All right. Back so I have a follow-up question to that real quick, because I think that's really interesting. You were talking about how, so did you lay down the plot as you wanted it and then sort of went into the research of, you know, making sure this is right, that's right. Or did you research all the way up front and then put your plot together or was it a mixture? That's a, that's a good question. It was definitely a mixture. So I don't outline. Um, I really respect writers who are disciplined enough that they have that outline to work off. And sometimes I'm jealous of that, but I, for me, need to not know what's happening and I need to go into it without knowing. I might write towards a twist. I'll often like have a twist in my mind that I want to happen and I can write towards that, but I like to not know. I never know who the killer is. I did not think the person who ended up doing it in this book, I absolutely did not think it was this person for the longest time. And then maybe about five, six of the way through, I was like, oh my gosh this is the person Mo mostly because there was another person I thought it was. And, but I couldn't get him and this other character to get together romantically. I kept thinking they would, I kept putting them in scene together. I kept thinking that's what they were going to do, <laughs> you know, and then they wouldn't. And I was like, okay, guys, I'm going to figure something else out. And so I ended up really actually liking the motivation, you know, rather than have it be something romantic. I liked that I needed to give them a different reason to do what they eventually do, mm -hmm. um, which made me work harder, which was good. Um, and, but I have no idea. I, I will have a sense of where things should go next. I often have a sense of location. Like I'll feel like, okay, they've been in this apartment for two scenes now and I've got to get them out of there and let's put them all, you know, like in this room and Playwrights Horizons, Horizons is in the book, like a, a theater, like let's put them there and then let's put them at an, at a bar or something. You know, you'll have an idea where, where to go next, but then I often just put them all into scene and see what they do. Cause then it feels like watching a movie and then I can't wait to see what happens. And I think that keeps me, keeps me writing, keeps me going. Um, to figure out who did what. Okay. Well, you're making this book sound terrific. So good on you. That's <laughs> that's right. always okay. helpful. This is not your first book, though. And as I think I already alluded in the introduction, you've got previous careers on television mm -hmm. and your jewelry designs that put you on television. They're being worn by a lot of famous people. How did you get started as a writer? So, well, I, I always loved to write. So even when I was a little girl, I would, I would hole up in my bedroom and, you know, write mm -hmm. stories and 
all the time. Uh, and I guess I sort of always thought it was this thing that I would either maybe come back to. I'm not really sure why it wasn't. It wasn't the thing I went for right out of college. I was a acting major in college. And so I did some plays and some, you know, movies, but I had, you know, about a dollar to my name and I kind of was like, okay, I have to figure out a way to make money. So I was bartending and waitressing and acting and always writing, but oh, like always writing, woke up, woke up and wrote first thing always. Um, and then maybe we'd go to an audition and then we'd go bartend. And then at one point I kind of, I, I was, I'm not, I'm not a huge night owl. And I was like, I've got to figure out a job that happens in the day. Like, you know, um, and so I took a job at a, at a little boutique and, um, I, started, you know, I was 24, 25. So I had like a lot of bravery and I kind of was like, Oh, I could make jewelry like this. I'll just make something like this. And then I had a piece on that. I was, I mean, so I was making like, you know, $10 an hour as a sales girl. And, but I had it like, I was wearing a piece and a customer said, Oh, I love that. And I was like, Oh, well it's for sale, which is the wrong thing to do. And if anyone is listening, don't do that. But the, <laughs> the woman who owns the boutique is still one of my really good friends. She just kind of like, let it go. And then she was like, okay, we're going to make you a little shelf and you can sell your pieces there. We're going to give you this little shelf. Um, and then it's funny because it was, that was what I did for years and years. I made jewelry. I talked about style and style segments and things like that. And um, I hosted it. I, I was, I did this show on the home shopping network for years and it, it was so much fun. I loved every second of it. I loved being, you know, it was just, it was a lot of fun. And then I kind of thought, okay, well, there should be a book about this, right? Because creative careers are so circuitous and there's not always a straight path and you, there's a lot of detours and there's a lot of figuring out what you really want to do. And so I wrote a proposal for a book called Creative Girl. And that was helpful because it, it led me to my agent. Um, and he's so wonderful. And he's been my agent for 13 years and is, he's just always supporting me and, uh, you know, like steering me in the right direction. Um, and so that was really helpful because that book led me to him. And then I, I but I, I remember saying to him, but I really want to write fiction. And he's like, okay, great. You know, when I take a writer on, I take them on for their nonfiction, their fiction, their whole career. So we, I wrote a novel. It did not sell. Um, I wrote like a full, it was a paranormal romance. I actually really love it. And I love that book. I should, I always like think about, I've rewritten it like a thousand times since 2008. They're like, we're barely even cell phones in the book. I'm like, I guess I should put cell phones in there. But um, so it was just so long ago. And so, and that one did, but it didn't sell. And I remember I was just devastated. Um, uh, but I'm like pretty stubborn when it comes to that kind of stuff. I kind of took a few days. I cry, I actually cried. I remember I cried myself to sleep for the first time in like a decade because, you know, I was married. There wasn't like that much to, wasn't like I'd gotten my heart broken recently, but I remember being heartbroken over that book, not selling. And then a few days later, I was like, okay, well, I've got to figure this out. So I started to write other projects. And then I submitted a sample to almost like audition for this, not audition, that's not the right way to say it, but I got a ghostwriting job. So I wrote three novels under someone else's name, which is like, as you know, something that sometimes happens in the business, if the, if the writer has been either signed up for too many projects or they're, you know, they, maybe they have something going on in their personal life, um, that they can't do the contract. So I wrote three novels, which was really helpful because I kind of learned the art of story and plotting. Um, and they were really, you know, they were, it was a really good experience writing suspense. And then mm -hmm. I felt like I was really ready to write my own. Cause at that point I'd written, let's say four full novels. Um, even though they, none of them had been published uh, under my name. But then I thought, okay, I'm ready for this. And so I wrote a proposal. Um, there was a woman in my agent's agency, another agent, and she said, let's write a book about, she's like, you should write a book about a book called The Boyfriend App. And it should be about a girl who can get any boyfriend that she wants with an app. Um, and she said, go ahead. She gave me all this freedom. She was like, go ahead and just write that book and take it where you want and let's try to sell it. And we did sell it. We, we, we sent it to Alessandra Balzer, who's a wonderful, wonderful editor at HarperCollins. And she bought that book. And so I did three books for Alessandra, three books for HarperCollins. And then, so at that point I was in my mid thirties when I was done doing those three. And I kind of, I really wanted to write adult. I really wanted to try writing adult suspense. And so I wrote, uh, we were mothers, which is the first of the three suspense novels that I did for Amazon little a. Um, and I really love doing those as well. I mean, I love both genres, but I, I feel more like an adult. So I think it made sense to kind of go towards adult as of now. I'd love to go back to YA at some point. But. You know, you raise an issue, it. which you'd probably just as well, I didn't bring up, but too oh, late. Go ahead. I love but <laughs> this, yes, is, this, you know, being a thriller, I might expect this to come from Thomas and Mercer, but it's not. It's coming from little A. Does mm -hmm. that reflect mm -hmm. some kind of dual genre purposing here or what? Oh, yeah. No, it's, yeah. So it's so funny. You know, I 
connected with the Carmen Johnson is my editor and I, I just really adore her and respect her. And she, what I like about little a and what I like about Carmen is that it's a, it's, it has a lot of their literary fiction. So I always feel like I better do a good job with the writing or they're going to be like, <laughs> you know, well, how did this girl sneak in here? You know? So, so I know that I think, liter- I think, but like you said, Thomas and Mercer, so much of their suspense is there. There's also Lake Union, which does really wonderful, readable, um, pretty delicious, like books that you want to be reading, um, book club fiction and women's fiction. Um, and I think that little a is known for, I don't know, I guess all kinds of wonderful fiction books. So I, I feel like, well, I better try to keep up here. You know, it's like wow. when you're playing with the, with the, <laughs> the more skillful players, you're like, well, it better make sure these sentences are singing or else someone's going to catch on to me. Um, so yeah, so we work, I really enjoy working with them. I just, I love my editor. She's really smart. I really respect her when she tells me something. I always, I tend to agree with it. And if I don't agree with it at first, I give myself like a day. And generally by the next day, I'm like, oh, she's right. Mm. So that, that's a great point, Katie. A lot of people fear the editor, right? Like when they were, they're first yeah. starting, they think, oh my gosh, I'm just going to rip my book apart and it's going to be a terrible experience. Mm-hmm. Boy, it, it, you get a good editor. It's the best experience oh, ever. And, the best yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. so tell I mean, us. It's, it's a, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, it's like a, it's a fine line, right? Because on one hand, I feel from her that she, she, I can tell that she trusts me. Like once I called her in the middle of writing this book with a question and she said, she was like, I, I think you know the answer to this. She's like, you know, your readers. And I felt so emboldened because I'm like, okay, I have her. She trusts you know, my instincts on this book, but then you also, I find that whenever in general, I think collaboration makes books so much stronger. Um, so I, I do welcome the feedback, even bad reviews. I'm okay with, cause I'm kind of like, well, there there's probably, even if I don't totally agree with it, there's probably something I can <laughs> pull out and learn from. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, so tell us a little bit about, like you told us you're um, a pantser, which Bill and I mm-hmm. love to talk about endlessly, but we won't make you talk about it endlessly. But I'm also a pantser, so I love that. Um, I love talking, so yeah. what does a pantser's typical writing day look like? Um, you're not making spreadsheets and outlines and checking off boxes mm-hmm. and such. Mm-hmm. Um, what, so what does your, tell us, walk us through your day as a writer. So, well, I think because of my um stage in life. I have, you know, four kids under 11, my day in life, my writer life, I would say is only about an hour of my day, but an hour or two. So mostly I, you know, we, we all wake up in the morning, I get everybody ready for school. And then I will generally write for about my little ones are still in pre-K. So they're not there. They're not in school for that long. So I'll generally try to do one to two hours of writing. Um, and, and that'll kind of do it. I hope to stretch that out. Like when they, when my little us go to kindergarten, Um, I hope to maybe take on some more writing projects and try to like build that muscle back up. Cause I remember before kids, when, especially when I was doing those ghost writing projects, I could write for a good six hours a day. And I would like, I'd love to get that muscle back right now. I don't, I don't still have that. I definitely, you know, at about two hours, I'm like, Oh God, I need a snack, you know, and then I'm done. So yeah. What about you guys? How, how many hours do you guys write for a day? It depends, yeah. but I don't really want the six hour muscle back. That's, that's yeah, a lot that's of right. writing. Long, long. Yeah. I could do six You're hours in my twenties, but I can't yeah. do it now. I, yeah. you know, I mean, or if I the deadline day, is tomorrow. But, yeah. Yeah. I can do the deadline, day, but not with writing. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so am I right? You've done six books now, or is it six books plus the the ghost written ones? Plus the nonfiction. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess seven, this would be the seventh book total, six novels. Okay. So what are some of the things you've learned along the way in terms of writing? You, 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 in terms uh, of writing. I, I don't want to be offensive, but you probably didn't know everything when you started. What have you learned since then? Right. No. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I think one of the things I've learned is that I find that a class and a group is really helpful. And even now, sometimes I have to make like a makeshift group um, and I will go to different readers at different points. uh, And then I always try to return the favor. A lot of my readers are not writers. So, um, you know, I have to be extra helpful with like kid pickups and, you know, Mm. I don't know, maybe picking up the cake for someone's birthday party. I mean, I have to figure out other ways to 
But a lot of my friends will read and it's really helpful. So I think getting feedback is super helpful as a writer. Because sometimes you just don't know when you've written something that's a little too confusing or you're making somebody so unlikable that that your readers don't want to read about them. Um, and okay, what else have I learned in terms of writing? Oh man, I think it helps to read everything mm-hmm. in different genres, your own genre. I think I consider that to be sort of part of my job is to really be reading and really see what works and what doesn't work in story. And I pay attention to when I'm watching TV because I always feel like there's such a good beginning, middle and end when you watch a show. Um, but I think the biggest thing by far is just practicing it and and not thinking of it as, I think sometimes, you know, you certainly wouldn't start the piano and expect to be fantastic in a year, but you would, you would expect to practice and expect to work so hard at it. And I think writing is the same. I mean, I think, I don't think there's some magical writing gene that, you know, you, that you have to just start off writing these pristine sentences. I think it all comes with time and with work. You know, when people talk about the 10,000 hours, mm-hmm. I just... I just think it's all, I really think it's all about practice because I can tell even looking back that the stuff that I wrote that didn't get published really, it, it, things have gotten better since then. You know, each book I think tends to get a little better, um, whether it's in terms of writing and story or both or characters. But I would say, I would say practice is honestly the biggest thing I've learned. Mm-hmm. And now that I've seen it from the other side, I'm like, oh, right, this, this is worth putting in the time because it's, a, you know, it's important. Well, that's one thing I think we all love about writing is that uh, you you grow with each book. You never make it, you know. So, um, right. right. And it's kind of exciting. And that's what I like about like, it. Well, what yeah. if I something really good, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, what or if you can tell us, what are you going to tackle next? What's your next project? So I have, I have two books um, under contract with with Amazon Little A, and the next one is called The Vacation Rental, and it's going to be about a woman who rents out her her home with some very unexpected results. Um, and I I sort of was thinking about it during the pandemic because I had friends who were, you know, renting out their country homes to families that would want to come up maybe and escape from the city, um, and I just sort of thought, oh my God, strangers in your home, right? You know that you've arranged to be there, which of course is wonderful and lovely. And, and I get it, but also I thought that's really right writing ground. I mean, somebody mm-hmm. else in your home lying in your bed, is really, truly <laughs> a story if I've ever heard one. So I thought that would be a fun thing to write. So that's what I'm working on next. And then there's one more to come after that. And it's always, you know, some, I know some writers don't like to write under contract, but I love having a contract. I feel so grateful to know that I'm employed for the next like two years or so. I mean, that's a really good feeling. So I'm very grateful for that. Well, I have one last question. What are you planning for Thanksgiving? <laughs> oh man, I'm so excited. So I'm so I I often will host. I'm a terrible terrible cook. Uh, otherwise, I would invite you, but oh. it, the food is never really you know it's not my strength. Um, I mean, I'm not terrible. I'm mediocre, which is almost worse than being terrible. <laughs> it's just medium. Um, so, but I am a very relaxed host. <laughs> It's edible. It's edible. Um, I am a relax. I make up for it by being like very, I'm like pretty relaxed. Like I love when everyone, I love when everyone's over. So this, the good, so we're, go- but this Thanksgiving, we're going to go to my brother's. He lives in Southport and he has three beautiful children. And I love my sister-in-law and she's a huge reader. So we always talk about books. And then my sister is coming in from Boston and my parents will be there too. So it's going to be great. It'll be great. It sounds good. And the food will be good. She's a good cook. Well, congratulations again on the new book, and thanks so much for being on the podcast. Really glad you could be here. Thank you for having me. It was really nice to be here. Thanks, you guys, so much. Hey, if you haven't joined the WriterCon Facebook group yet, do it now. Do it today. The the you can Google for it on or what is it not on Facebook? You wouldn't be Googling. You'd be searching for it. Or there's a link in the show notes you can follow. Join this wonderful community of writers and find out what's going on between podcasts. And speaking of, if you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe, then rate or review it wherever you get podcasts. It does make it easier for new listeners, new writers like you to discover us. All right. Until next time, keep writing. And remember, like Colleen Hoover, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.